And we are back on the build phase. I am Mr. Ben, and today we are doing another in-depth Dice Throne hero review and analysis. And the chosen hero today is the Paladin. So I do have my usual housekeeping spiel to go through at the top of this video, but I have one additional part that I want to add, and that is the amount of intimidation that I felt approaching this particular hero. Uh, this is a hero that has some things about the way his kit plays that doesn't really appeal to me as a player. It doesn't connect with my biases. Uh, I was piloting this hero in my last game of my championship run at the Master Series, so I do have some experience playing this guy at the, the tip of the top of competitive dice throne. But there are things about this guy that just don't mesh well with me as a player that said, I know how beloved he is, so I want to do a really good job uh, for the competitive community, for, for the Paladin stands out there. I don't want to let you guys down just because me and Pally have a little bit of beef. So to, to run into my typical housekeeping stuff, uh, the intent of this video is to approach this character from a competitive standpoint. What I want to do is lay out the things I think about when I'm playing this character to try to win more games and specifically win those games within a competitive setting. Now, if you don't want to play in a competitive setting, if that doesn't appeal to you, if you are just here because you enjoy Kitchen Table Dice Throne and this is a hero you have and you want to do better, I will try to make this video approachable and digestible for players of all skill levels. But if you don't really care about in-depth analysis about every single card you just want to see general strategy stuff you can skip to the end of the video where i do a basic analysis of this is how you should play paladin this is how you play against him another thing to keep in mind even if you are one of those players who wants to play at the tournament level and approaches this game with a competitive mindset the way i do we might not play the game in exactly the same way so i'm gonna explain how i feel about paladin from my perspective as a player and some of my analysis might not completely connect with your biases or, or your tendencies as a player. And that's completely okay too. But I hope that by at least laying out how I think about that character, that can help other people get a better grasp on playing Paladin and win more games no matter what their level of competition is. All right. So I like to start these by taking a look at the pamphlet because so many characters kind of revolve around and rely on their status effects getting a grasp on those is probably the thing we should be doing first now paladin has a lot of status effects just a whole mess of them and all right so let's take a closer look at each of these status effects starting with retribution so this allows you to spend this when you're being attacked as a result of your opponent's offensive roll phase and then you get to deal half of whatever the incoming damage is back to the attacker this is a pretty good status effect. It can make people play suboptimally. They get real worried about having to get hit back, so they don't want to hit you as hard. And anything that slows the game down and makes Paladin able to see more cards, able to stretch the game out longer, these are things that we want as a Paladin player. So Retribution is a great status effect. Uh, notably, it has a stack limit of one. We, we will be revisiting the theme of low stack limits on some of these specialized status effects over and over again. Next up, we have crit. Again, stack limit of one. You can spend this to, if your attack is dealing at least five damage, you can spend this to add four more to it. So this is an attack modifier. It feels like a win more, just a basic analysis. Hey, I'm already doing a decent attack. Let's make a decent attack better. But the idea of a critical hit fits very much with the theme of Paladin, kind of a classic D&D trope. Uh, we have the Protect Token, again, only stack limit of one. This allows you to prevent half the damage that is incoming. This can save your life. This is part of what makes the Paladin so hard to deal with, is this patchwork of different damage mitigation and healing angles that he has. Protect is maybe one of the more obvious ones that contributes to his durability, but this couldn't do it alone. It works together in a whole machinery of damage erasure that can be very frustrating for your opponent. Uh, next, we have accuracy. This is, again, a stack limit of one. You spend this and it turns one of your attacks undefendable. This is very valuable against heroes that 
are going to do mean things to you on their defense. Like Pyromancer is kind of the classic example of just pouring more damage on, but also characters like Shadow Thief or Artificer or Cursed Pirate that kind of rely on their defense roles to help keep their game going to, to do what they want to do. Accuracy is a way that you can avoid it. Always undefendable attacks are going to be better than defendable attacks, but in certain matchups that becomes extremely valuable. Finally, we have the Blessing of Divinity. Again, a stack limit one. Uh, I believe it's just Paladin and Seraph that have this, this status. The next time a player with this token would have their health reduced to zero, remove it, and instead their health is one. So it can't be removed or transferred by any means, which can be really annoying to deal with, but there are a variety of ways to clear the blessing before you shoot in for that last attack. Finally, I want to bring notice to the to his die facing being 2211. This is a dice face that we see on my favorite hero in the game, Shadow Thief. But the difference between Shadow Thief and Paladin is Shadow Thief's board is a lot nicer to this dice facing. One of the things that we're going to notice as we move into the Paladin's board, which we're going to do right now, is that the Paladin has some very awkward role objectives. And this is one of the biggest challenges for this hero. So as always, I want to comment on the gorgeous artwork, the individual panels for the of art for the, the abilities always look good, but there's something about a dice thrown board in its totality that just Ha 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 makes an epic statement when it hits the table. And this one, of course, is no exception. Uh, so let's start digging into the Paladin's board a little more closely. And we're going to start with Tithe. It is hard to fully describe how important this power is to the Paladin, but also how careful and deliberate you need to be in using it. So at its base, it allows you to reroll one of your dice at any time for one combat point. You can also draw a card at a cost of three combat points per card. Now, the first impulse that I think all of us have when we look at this is, oh, this is here to save the Paladin from whiffing on rolls. And the impulse, at least me, and I think a lot of people have when they see that is, oh, this is like, this is like bumpers when we're bowling. This is this is an error correction system. So I don't have to be as tight in my dice rolling and my decision making because I have this safety valve. No, this is not solid paladin thinking, in my opinion. I think the reroll part of this is a bailout. This is, uh oh, I'm in big trouble. Maybe I can bail myself out with it, but it shouldn't be part of your plan A. The important part of this card is card draw. Paladin needs cards. He needs cards. And one of the things about Paladin's cards is they're all really expensive. So he does isn't, even though he has a great economy and lots of ways to generate additional cards, lots of ways to generate additional combat points, he actually needs this large volume of stuff. Whereas there's some heroes who they get their economy going and you feel like you have more coins than you know what to do with. Even when Paladin is running really hot and he's doing some of his best stuff, you might still be going up to four or five coins and spending them all down for a single card. His stuff is expensive. He needs those that economy. Once we upgrade Tithe, what does it look at? Well, this is a three cost upgrade. Now, in a lot of these videos, I react strongly to the number three on an upgrade cost. And in a vacuum, that is a pretty high cost. But again, we have to compare the Paladin to the Paladin and all his cards are expensive. So a three cost upgrade is not as outrageous on this character as it would be on other heroes. This still allows you to reroll one of your dice at a cost of one coin per reroll. It still has the ability to draw a card, but it's discounted by one. And somewhat occasionally, whenever you activate an ability that has a six being used in it, you gain a combat point. Now, to be clear, if you declare a straight that's like, two to six, that still triggers this. Even though the straight doesn't care about the symbol, if a six is used in activating the ability, you still get the combat point. I call that out specifically because in one of my earliest games of Dice Throne, I was told it worked the other way and I believed it for years. So always check stuff in the rule book. Don't trust your friends. They're gonna, they're gonna shark you. Okay, that's not true. Trust your friends. Okay, this is a just a phenomenal card. 
Uh, reducing the cost of the card draw is huge. The ability to have a little bit of extra combat point generation is gravy on what is already a fantastic ability. Uh, the fact that this passive replaces a basic attack for Paladin, though, is a skill check that I think we can't overlook. Having a basic attack, nobody wants to activate their basic attack, but having a basic attack is something that if we rely on as dice throwing players. All the heroes have these basic attacks. Oh man, my my role has gone to crap, but at least I can activate a, a three symbol basic. Paladin doesn't have that bailout. So you, again, a theme that we're going to hit over and over with this guy is that you have to be deliberative and careful in how you craft your turns and what your role objectives are, which means you can't be capriciously spending resources. So you you do have the backup power of spending a coin to reroll a die, but again, if you use that all the time, you're just going to run out of coins and you're not going to be able to play your impactful cards. Further, you don't have the basic attack to fall back on like all the other heroes do. So we are already starting to see some of the things about the Paladin's kit that drive me up a wall. This is a highly skill-testing character with very uncooperative dice and wild roll objectives, but we're going to get into that right now. Next, we are going to be taking a look at Righteous Combat. This is three swords and two helmets. Uh, a lot of times when we see uh, full house style abilities, the three is like the four five face, and then you need to have two, but both swords and helmets are two faces each on this hero. So even though the, the arrangement visually looks a little different than we would expect to see from a lot of full house abilities, the but the odds are actually a little bit worse than some other heroes full houses because again it's two die faces for the sword and two die faces for the helmet uh, as opposed to three and two so what do we get for the this uh, full house ability well you get a deal five damage and you roll two rider dice which can then if they're both swords they transform into two damage each for an additional four so this could be a nine damage attack right there uh, if they're helmets it's one damage each you can heal two or four and you can potentially gain some combat points the thing about this power now if you just look at this power in a vacuum uh, i talk in a lot of these videos about how what i want to do is generate seven damage or more per turn seven being average you have to assume that your opponent's defense is going to soak some of that most of the time so really i want to generate more than seven damage per turn but that's kind of the the threshold on a power this thing unless your rider dice are cooperative defaults at five, which feels like not a very attractive option unless we think back to the Paladin's pamphlet when we were talking about the crit status effect. And that's where the value of Righteous Combat comes in. This is an ability that allows you to spend your crit. Potentially, you can roll into some more damage with those riders, but the more important thing is that by default, it does the five, and that's what's necessary to be able to get those crits off your board. I want to take a second here and address stack limits. Now, I mentioned this before on the pamphlet, but it's something that you really need to pay attention to. A lot of what the Paladin does is tied up in his variety of status effects, and those status effects are all stack limit one, which means you really don't want to end up activating abilities that generate a crit and then activate an ability that generates a crit because you've now just wasted. You've wasted some form of your economy you've wasted some form of what this character wants to do you need to bounce back and forth between generating your your crits your accuracies and firing off your righteous combats so that's something to keep in mind so when we upgrade this what are we looking at uh, at righteous combat 2 it's going to cost us two combat points which seems cheap for a paladin card but it's still a significant investment considering the two plus the one that you could get from selling it this keeps the same damage value, but allows you to roll three Rider dice, which potentially produce even more combat points, damage, or healing. I'm not real sold on Righteous Combat 2. Uh, early in the game, I think there's an argument that you could buy it because you, you know that you are going to want to come back to Righteous Combat every few turns. If you can, you know you're likely to fire this off a couple times in the game and having that extra die to produce a little more damage, produce a little more healing, it is important. But again, 
Paladin has really expensive cards and some of them are better than others. So I, outside of like maybe turn one or two, I am reluctant to invest the two combat points in Righteous Combat 2. Going up to Righteous Combat 3, however, and I find it almost hard to say, but this four cost upgrade uh, that's very expensive for an upgrade feels almost typical for Paladin, uh, but this is an upgrade I think I can really get behind, even at its high cost. Let's start from the bottom and move up. The back of ability that this gives you is basically just, hey, you missed your righteous combat, but look, here's here's something that is better than nothing. It's undefendable, which is awesome. That helps you out in a lot of matchups, and it also offers a little bit of healing. Now, a second ago, I said the undefendable was awesome. To be fair, this ability is not awesome this is a backup ability but it's a backup ability that i don't think you feel horrible about stumbling into when your opponent helping hands away your third sword or your second helmet or whatever now as far as what this does for righteous combat the primary reason we're here talking about this card this increases the damage to six you roll three dice and everything else stays basically the same i feel like the increased damage the backup ability all of this works together to make this a card that if I see it particularly early in the game, I want to play it. Now, I want to be clear about why I'm a little higher on Steadfast than I might be about other backup abilities uh, in the past. Paladin's dice and his board present some very difficult to roll for stuff. And there are a few things I hate more in Dice Throne than having to say, I whiff past turn that feels awful so having a backup on an ability you know you're going to be taking you know you're going to be rolling for and and it's a passable ability now it's not a lot of damage and it's not a lot of healing but the two things together i think make this an upgrade that i don't feel bad about getting even at its inflated cost now last couple turns of the game maybe this is maybe this isn't as good uh, but this is an upgrade most of the time when I see it, I like to get this one out into play. Okay, let's move up to talk about Retaliate. So this is like a setup ability for the Paladin. Somebody gets to gain uh, Retribution, obviously in 1v1 you're going to choose yourself, I hope, uh, and you gain three combat points. So this is going to require three of your 3-4 die face and a six. Uh, particularly early in the game, or if you think your opponent is gearing up, like if your opponent hasn't done a, a big attack for a while, but they're holding a grip of cards and the way they're kind of like looking over their board, if you get that vibe that your opponent is trying to set up for a big swing at you, I don't think you feel bad grabbing a retaliate. If you know your opponent is about to come at you for 10 damage or like that shadow thief has a full purse and he's about to club you with it, uh, that's a great time to say, you know what, I'm going to spend my turn trying to chase down a Retribution. Now, when we upgrade this card, it only costs one. Automatically, that makes it a pretty decent upgrade for Paladin, just cost-wise. Uh, it increases the amount of combat points by one. So if you activate this ability once with the upgrade, it kind of pays for itself immediately, which I like to see. We don't often see upgrades that pay for themselves off one activation. This one does. And this offers you another backup role. And this is a good backup role. I mean, I was excited might be putting it too strong, but I was feeling positive about the two damage, two healing, or, sorry, two undefendable damage, two healing backup ability. This is three undefendable damage. You still get the retribution and you heal one. So this is kind of the same backup ability. It just transfers one of the healing into one damage. That's fine. And again, when I play as Paladin, I like having backups. So there's a bunch of things that I like about this card. Probably the only place I would sell it is if you're just straight up combat point starved already. If you're feeling the pressure and you'd rather have that extra combat point to pay for uh, dice fix cards, if you, you've already found the cards you need, you just need to be able to have the combat points to pay for it. Sure. Uh, Paladin, I think... It, it's not as severe as Barbarian. I think Barbarian is the hero where you can just sell all the upgrades and go. So while there are some upgrades in the Paladin's kit that I think are basically always uh, better as combat points, this is one where I can go either way. I would like to play this particularly in the early game, but I'm not going to feel too terrible if I have to sell it. Okay, we'll move down to Mighty Prayer. 
So there's a theme here about low damage, undefendable attacks. Uh, attacks that can't activate crit, essentially. So this requires three of the one, two die face and a six. It deals three undefendable damage. You gain a crit and an accuracy. So this is a, another power where it's driven home how much the Paladin relies on his status effects to really get value out of his stuff. So to go to Mighty Prayer 2, this is a two cost upgrade. It goes up to four undefendable damage and you get both crit and accuracy. Think about the play pattern, like the optimal play pattern, the Rainbow Unicorn Paladin that I would love to be playing is one where you go Mighty Prayer and then your opponent smashes into your great defense and they feel bad about it. And then you go Righteous Combat and you spend that crit and that accuracy. I like this upgrade and I haven't even gotten to the backup ability. I, I do feel a, like a little bit like I'm having an out-of-body experience being so positive about some of these backup abilities because normally I look pretty down on a lot of fallback options that are tacked onto these cards, but this is another one where offensive stance, yes, you don't want this, but hey, your opponent helping hand it away uh, your third sword, why your opponent wouldn't have targeted the six with helping hand, I don't know, maybe they're new. Uh, but for whatever reason, you only have two swords and the six, and you're still able to get a couple undefendable damage out there and then gain one of your also important status effects. It's kind of like between level one and the upgrade and offensive stance, we have three versions of the exact same power. Obviously, Mighty Prayer 2 is the best version of all three. It, it could be that I'm just so traumatized from all the times that I've whiffed with Paladin that I have... I, I have gotten like Stockholm syndrome into like, I need backup abilities with this guy. Uh, this One of my biggest gripes with this hero is how awkward his role objectives are. But man, when he clicks, he feels unstoppable. So to the point though, Mighty Prayer, I think this is an upgrade that particularly early in the game, I think is something you want to take if you can get even late game. Four undefendable damage is a significant number and having crit and accuracy to then set you up for like a kill turn next turn where you can push through an undefendable attack or make a defendable attack undefendable with the accuracy and then finish them off with the crit. This is a great, this is a great power. I like this upgrade a great deal. Moving up to holy attack. So Paladin is one of those lucky heroes that has both their straights on one ability. Uh, I do like seeing this. It feels like he gets like a free power, or I should say most of the time it feels like a hero who has this set up with our straights gets a free power, except when they're playing Loki. But with Paladin, one of his powers is deleted for Tithe. So this just, this isn't an extra Paladin ability. This just gets him up to normal number of abilities. Uh, and neither one of these straights are very good. Now, Often I say at this part of the review, you're going to take small straights in every game because sometimes the dice just give them to you. And that's true. You are going to be activating straights some percentage of the time, but you're looking at a six damage base attack. I will say this is an attack that is big enough that you can use crit on it. So if you have a crit on your board, all of a sudden your six damage turns into 10 damage on your small straight. That looks pretty awesome. The one healing feels a little bit incidental, but again, the thing we have to keep in mind with Paladin is that his defensiveness and damage mitigation isn't like Shadow Thief, where it's like one thing that stops the damage. Paladin has like a tapestry of abilities working together that are able to chip off a little bit of damage here, do a little bit of healing there. So while this healing seems kind of meh, it's each instance of healing, very few instances of Paladin healing are awesome but they all add up together to be in a very strong defensive base for this hero. If we look at the large straight version, that's going to be eight damage. Of course, if you crit with it, you can get that up to 12. It's, it's okay. I, as far as straights go, these are pretty unappealing to me, but like I say, every time I talk about straights, sometimes you just take the small straight because it's what the dice gave you. When you pay for the upgrade at two combat points, it gets up to average damage on the small straight and nine damage on the large straight uh, seven and nine is definitely better than six and eight but we're talking about two combat points to pay for this thing plus the one you didn't get from selling this upgrade i think this upgrade is one of the safest cells in the paladin's whole kit i don't want to play this i don't really want to be doing these abilities it, holy attack is kind of like a fallback for righteous combat like you didn't get your righteous combat which is really where you want to be on those activation turns versus setup turns 
but this, yeah, you're going to do it some amount of time, but do I want to invest in it? Do I want to upgrade it? No, I don't want to use this power. Anytime when I'm using Holy Attack, I would have rather been using Righteous Combat 10 times out of 10. All right, so we'll sell this one and we'll move on to the next. Our next ability is Holy Light. So this is very easy to roll for. You need two fives and then you heal one for each five you rolled. Plus you roll two Rider Dice, which can let you gain a crit, a protect, draw a card, or gain two combat points. So this Holy Light power does a little bit of everything that the Paladin wants to do. It, the problem is rolling it with just two fives is not good. Your whole turn comes down to like, heal to draw a card that is not enough to win games now paladin can kind of get away with a slower more plodding gameplay style because he soaks so much damage but healing two off your whole ability i mean we're doing better healing up here with straights and these aren't that great even with the damage holy light you really want to get it you should be thinking of holy light like an ultimate uh like shadow thief with his cardicopia you want to see three, four, a whole ultimate of hearts to activate this ability. This, in my opinion, is a whole fallback. I I know that there are setup plays where Holy Light can act kind of in a similar vein to Mighty Prayer, but I would much rather do Mighty Prayer where I'm doing damage to my opponent and at the same time getting my setup. Well, does this get better when we upgrade? Okay, well, it costs two combat points to upgrade this. Uh, you still have the part of it where you gain one per heart you rolled. So a two heart holy light is not good. I do not like a two heart holy light. I I look I rank that lower as an ability than most backup abilities. But let's say we get our four hearts. I heal four. I roll my three dice. I can then gain a crit, protect, potentially draw three cards if they're all hearts, and then I can gain combat points equal to the number of sixes. So the, the fundamental difference between Holy Light 1 and 2 is that you're able to draw more than one card or gain more than one combat point. So you don't need the dice to uh, spread out as much as you do at level 1. I think I play this upgrade 0% of the time. I am not a huge fan of the base level of this power. I cannot see myself investing two plus not being essentially three combat points to get this out onto the board. Uh, I know there's people that are fans of this. So there is a version of Paladin where you just turtle up and you don't try to do anything offensive. You just holy light and use your retributions and, you, and your great defense to try to chip your opponent down over time. Uh, and you don't even try to attack. I don't want to do any of that. And even if I did want to do that, I don't want to do that with Holy Light. I, I Yeah, I I don't think this is an upgrade that I personally want to play. Now, if you prefer a more Healy uh, Paladin style, maybe there's room for this. But I kind of look at this the same way I look at the uh, healing ability on the Barbarian's board. This is just not something I want to do in a typical game. And if I end up doing it, I'm probably a little grumpy. So in my opinion, this upgrade is a sell. All right, we're going to move up to... The uh, Righteous Prayer, our mini ult. So this is eight defendable damage. You gain a crit and gain two combat points. Notably, this is one of the characters with whom the then language is actually meaningful. Uh, that is not always the case in Dice Throne, but particularly with Monk and Paladin, they really leaned into this deal your damage, then you get a thing uh, language. So you can't use the crit on the same turn when you Righteous Prayer. And you might be thinking, wait, why is that defendable? Isn't everybody's mini ult undefendable? Nope, not everybody, not the Paladin. Uh, I, If you get four sixes, probably what happened was you had an ult and your opponent pushed you off of it. So of course you're gonna take Righteous Prayer rather than say the word with and do nothing. I'm not sure how hard I would chase this ability unless I already have a crit. If you already have a crit and you can come in and deal 12, replenish your crit and gain two combat points, cool. But I'm, if I'm chasing this, I'm chasing the ult. The, this, unlike, say, Pyromancer is a hero where the mini ult is sometimes actually better than ulting. Uh, that's not the case here. So if we upgrade this, does it get any better? At Righteous Prayer 2, it costs two combat points and it becomes undefendable damage. Now. 
that is meaningful. I do really like undefendable damage, but your mileage may vary because in some matchups you don't really care about your opponent's defense, and in some matchups your opponent's defense is a huge deal, looking at you, Shadow Thief. Uh, you still gain a crit, you still gain the two combat points, so this will pay for itself with a single activation of this ability that you probably shouldn't be chasing and don't necessarily want. Uh, and the backup is much more like the backup roles that I'm used to seeing. You don't want this. This is, I haven't been able to say that yet this video, but this is barely better than a whiff. Uh, prosperity, four combat points. Yes, it would pay for the, the combat points you invested in playing this upgrade if you activate it once, but you're taking an entire turn off to generate four combat points when you're playing with a hero who has the ability to generate close to that amount on multiple other powers and also deal damage and advance the game state and try to win. Uh, this is not a good back of ability. Uh, this is not a back of ability I want other than to avoid having to say the word with the upgrade making the mini alt undefendable is pretty cool, but there are better ways. I would rather try to get eight undefendable, undefendable damage across the board through a combination of righteous combat and an accuracy token. That's how I would like to accomplish that rather than trying to chase four sixes. Now, Paladin does have the ability to go through his deck and draw a lot more cards than other heroes. So he is going to see a lot more dice fixing cards than other heroes. And he's going to generate a lot more combat points than other heroes. And there may be some games where you just flat out don't have the ability to piece together righteous combat plus accuracy. And if that's the case, maybe you want this upgrade. But then even once you play this upgrade, you have to roll this ability and... I think the alternate plan that I'm suggesting is easier to get than rolling this ability. So I feel pretty comfortable and confident selling this upgrade and not chasing this ability, even though I fully acknowledge sometimes you present your dice for an ult and you end up on a mini ult instead. Okay, now we're really getting into some of the bread and butter paladin stuff. So this hero is defined by his ability to not take damage, to make you feel bad for attacking him. His base defense maybe doesn't drive that point home as hard as some of his upgrades, but we'll get to all that right now. His base defense is three dice. Uh, it can deal a maximum of one damage back because it's on uh, rather than per sword, which doesn't feel great, uh, but it can prevent one per helmet and two per heart, and then you can gain combat points for however many sixes you get. So at only three dice, the like the best mitigation roll here if you roll three hearts is going to block six which is good but you could maybe block one deal one back and gain a combat point this is all kind of smaller level stuff but it's not bad however where this defense really starts to hum is when we look at these upgrades so at divine defense two this is going to cost us three again that is not a negligible cost Three for an upgrade is an expensive value, although let's keep in mind how many extra combat points the Paladin produces compared to other heroes. Most notably, this changes the first ability to be per sword, not on a sword. So now you can roll four dice, potentially deal four damage, potentially stop eight, which is bonkers. Uh, most of the time you're not going to roll all four of the same die face, obviously, but the upper ceiling on some of these effects gets a lot higher. You know, if I stop four damage, deal one and gain a combat point, how bad do I feel? Like how much damage did you get through on me if I'm stopping four on my defense every other time or stopping three here, two there, six this one time? This defense is very strong. And the hits keep coming because once we get up to define defense three, the first thing that may make your heart go a flutter is that four cost on a defense upgrade. Now as a Shadow Thief player, I'm used to having to pay four costs to get the defense upgrade I want into play. But that is a big cost. That said, this is one of, if not the most important card in the Paladin's kit. I, maybe Divine Defense 3 and Tithe are, are kind of tied for the two cards that I most want to see when I'm playing Paladin. And everything else is a tier below that um, or, or further. So at four combat points, you are able to deal one damage per sword you roll. Again, you're staying at four dice. Uh, you get the one damage prevented per helmet, the two damage prevented per, per heart, and gain a combat point on the six. Now this is all the same as it was with the level two upgrade, but notably this adds if you get helmet, helmet, praying hands, so a, 
uh, three, four, three, four, and a six gain protect, which just pushes. Now that's not going to happen all that often. Remember, we can tithe to reroll stuff. This would be the kind of situation if I've got helmet, praying hands, and whatever else, this would be the kind of situation where maybe I, I throw a coin to tithe to try to get that second helmet. Maybe I even throw away a heart to try to get that second helmet just to get that to protect because protect is such a valuable uh, defensive status effect. This is a very good upgrade. Uh, I think you probably play either version of this upgrade at any point in the game that you see them other than very, very late. Like if it's, hey, I have to win here or I'm dead next turn for sure. Well, okay, in that situation, maybe you don't play your defense upgrade. Uh, but this is a key part of the Paladin's kit. This is a defensive character and this is his defense most characters most heroes in most games the ability they activate more than any other is their defense now there are characters like ninja if if that's the person you're facing you're probably going to use your defense a little bit less frequently than you would with your typical hero so there are exceptions to that but generally speaking your defense is going to be used every other turn it's going to be used on your opponent's turn almost every turn almost every game and while the Paladin's default defense isn't terrible, these upgrades are some of the things that set Paladin apart and can really allow him to claw his way back into a game, even one where he's facing a big life deficit. So definitely must purchase upgrades, either two or three, but three is the one I really want to see every game. All right, let's take a peek at the Paladin's ultimate. To win with honor, purity and righteousness is the only true victory. Sweet flavor text, dude. So you need all sixes for this. You gain Blessing of Divinity, you heal five, and you deal 10 damage. If you don't already have a crit on you, 10 damage for an ultimate is some of the weakest ult damage in the entire game. If you do have that crit, well, now we're looking at 14, so that's much better. Uh, and Blessing of Divinity can be a game-defining status effect. Now, a lot of times, if your opponent is thinking ahead and they're prepared for the idea, hey, I know... Paladin draws a lot of cards. I know that means they're probably going to be able to find dice fixing cards. I know that means they're probably going to be able to do an ultimate. And therefore, I should know that I need to have a way to deal with Blessing of Divinity. That's either make sure you have a big enough health delta that when you get to the point where you have to kill him twice, taking that extra turn isn't going to put you in range of lethal or you need to have some kind of a main phase way to ping the Blessing of Divinity off, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Before we move on to uh, the general strategy for Paladin, I do want to circle back to the card kit. So let's take a look at his unique cards. Mighty, this is a one cost main phase action that allows you to gain a crit. I do not like this card. Don't hey. Now, that may sound like a hot take because this is essentially pay one, deal four damage. And in a perfect world, pay one, deal four is good. But there's a little more to what's going on with Mighty than just pay one, deal four. Because you've got to keep in mind the Paladin's role objectives are so awkward and his dice are so screwy that if I, in main phase one, pay one, play this card, gain a crit, I now really don't want to roll an ability that gives me a crit. And if I do, I just basically paid two combat points to make my own offensive roll phase worse. That is terrible. And those kinds of punish moments are things that I personally try really hard to avoid in games because they get me tilted. I get really irritated when those kinds of plays happen. So the only place where I think this makes sense to play is if we're nearing the end game, you've got the cards in your hand that you know you're going to be able to essentially activate any ability you want I'm, I'm getting that righteous combat this turn. I'm getting that straight. I'm getting that ult this turn. You know you're going to be able to activate your ability. Maybe your opponent's hand is gutted that they're all their dice funny business cards are already in the discard pile. You know you're going to go for it. Then you play this card. You get the crit, and you go in and activate the ability that you know you want to activate using the, uh, using the dice fix cards that you have in your hand. I would never, I would advise no one to ever play this card just YOLO. Just, oh, well, I don't have the ability to change my dice or really dictate what I want to be rolling in this roll phase, but uh, let's throw it out there and hope I get righteous combat. No, 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 no. I mean, play however you want, but if you want to win games, no, 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 no. Um, 
I think this card is very often a sell, particularly early in the game. I do not want to pigeonhole myself into having to chase an ability that doesn't generate crit if I'm not already at the part of the game where I can kind of dictate what I want to do. Anywhere before that, like end state, this is basically an auto sell for me. I, I generally speaking, I don't like this card. The the feeling of, oh, I'm gonna come at you with a righteous combat, and then instead you roll a crit generating ability and you can't get off of it, and you just paid a combat point plus a whole card to make your own offensive roll phase worse. No, no, don't do it. Don't do it. All right, consecration, pay four combat points and get all the status effects. Lots of heroes have this card or a, a version of this card. Uh, Paladins is expensive, but this is better than a lot of heroes pay for it, get all the stuff for a couple of reasons. One, Paladin's economy is so much better than basically every, well, not Shadow Thief, but most other heroes. Paladin just generates a ton of combat points. So if you like being able to spend a bunch of points and do stuff in that way, this is a hero that's going to be great for you. So playing this isn't as much of an ask as it is for like say moon elf like if moon elf is going to pull off their pay for get all the status effects card that probably takes a couple turns to save up like it's much more of an investment and it makes the what status effects that much more backbreaking paladin can pull off a consecration and even if this runs straight into a what status effects it's th that still feels bad that still sucks but it's not as bad backbreaking as it can be for some other heroes so i think consecration is way more playable for paladin than uh, other heroes that have a similar type card. Obviously, this gets better the fewer status effects you already have on yourself. Uh, I would strongly recommend, though, if this is like part of your, you're going for a kill turn or you're trying to have a real banger of a turn, if you only have four combat points, don't do this. Don't, don't do it. Because if you spend the four, you get this pile of stuff and you go into your roll phase with no combat points, no ability to mess with your dice or guarantee the one of the war i talked about some of the punish feelings the paladin can generate and again maybe i'm being a little unfair to the guy but just as a player i have a real problem with heroes that can make me feel punished for playing the game and uh paladin is one of those heroes that can do it better than anybody else so you pay your four for consecrate you get all these cool status effects on your board and you don't have any combat points left to fix your rolls and you end up whiffing and then next turn your opponent what status affects you don't don't so you do want to have a little bit of discretion about when you deploy the consecration but i think this card is way more playable for paladin than it is for some other heroes who have a very similar card so this is more highly rated here than i i would some of the other versions of this card we've seen with other heroes moving on to blessed this is a one cost main phase power you roll a die you can either draw two cards heal three heal four or gain three combat points Generally speaking, if we just look at Tithe, a card is worth either three combat points or two combat points according to Tithe. So if we use that as a metric, this card lets you do a thing that's worth either four or six combat points or gain three combat points. Very rarely do I say I'd really prefer to roll a one than a six, but this is one of those times. Uh, the middle options of healing three, healing four, there's going to be games where that's super relevant. I think you play this card. I think you play this card basically every time you draw it, unless it's late enough in the game or your economy has been strangled through other things going on, like playing too many expensive upgrades. Paladin can afford to play more of his cards than some other heroes. And this is one that I think you really want to make room for. It's weird to play a card and roll a die and root for a one, but I kind of think that's what you want to do with this card more often than not. But even if you don't hit the one, this is good value all the way down. The six pays you right back. The, the middle options give you a little bit of healing. Pay one to heal four is super relevant. Pay one to heal three is less good, but it's still a relevant card. And again, Paladin benefits from healing three here, healing two there. Heal, and he, man, I, I healed 25 damage over the course of that game, but he does it in tiny increments. So this isn't like Vampire Lord where you get a big burst of like, wow, inducing healing. You just got to keep on that grind and, and build his network of damage mitigation to get wins with this guy. Absolution, one cost, roll phase card. You can only play it while being attacked. You roll a rider and you can either deal three damage back on a one or a two, on a three or a four, prevent three, on a five, prevent five. 
and on a six, prevent two and gain two combat points. Depending upon your situation, this is either a not this time or pay one deal three damage, which isn't bad either. I, this is a card I think you play. Uh, it is going to be a little frustrating at times when you really want that damage and you end up preventing five instead. Uh, any card that forces you to roll a die and the outcome has has that element of randomness, has the ability to feel a little bit frustrating, but I don't think there's any result here where you really get punished. Given that you can only play this while you're being attacked, the, the only real bad feeling I think you could get off this is if somebody's attacking you for like two. And if somebody attacks is attacking you for two damage, maybe you don't play this card and run the risk of rolling a five and preventing five damage off two attack. Maybe that's just not the play in that situation. Most games though, I think you're gonna find the right situation to play this card this isn't the most flashy or the most powerful card, but it is cool. I also like the idea that in a really tight game where you're both almost dead, this has the ability to get that get that counter punch in there to, to send a little more damage back at your opponent on top of whatever your defense did. I like killing my opponent on their attack. That, that can be really fun. And this plus his defense, you actually have pretty decent reach on the amount of damage Paladin can produce on the defense. You know, you, know, you can get up to like almost an average turn's worth of damage. Divine Favor, uh, again, most competitive events don't allow you to use the promo cards, but this is when I'm talking about the cards, so I'm gonna briefly go over this. It's a zero cost main phase card. You roll a D6 on a six, you gain four combat points, and on any other outcome, you draw a card. As far as these cards go, um, on a six, good things happen. Every other outcome, you draw a card. This is one of the weakest ones out of all of them. Given given how awesome Paladin's status effects are, maybe the determination was that his promo card couldn't just give him a free crit because it's just too strong. Uh, but four combat points feels pretty lukewarm. So in the promo department, I feel like the Paladin got, got shortchanged a little bit. But overall, this is one of the strongest heroes in Dice Throne. Uh, his damage output is not top tier, but he has accuracy and crit as status effects to make up for that, the, the lack of defense that's printed on his board. So as a, as a hero, his damage output can be quite high. He can have turns where he's able to put together impressive damage numbers on non-ult abilities. Uh, even his ult, if you've got the crit, 14 is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, but where Paladin really shines isn't his ability to push damage and punish your opponent for attacking you with big damage through retribution. It's his ability to mitigate. It's his ability to force the game to go long and make your opponent play at your pace. Chipping your opponent's attack damage down with prevention effects, healing back up. You know, if, if you prevent three and then you heal three, you might have just stuffed your opponent's whole turn. So if you're time walking your opponent every couple of turns while you're doing a setup turn, earning your crit, earning your accuracy, righteous combat for 10, they can't block. Setup turn. And the whole time you're doing your setup, setup big straight for unblockable damage that's crit and accuracy set up set up and while you're bouncing back and forth between your setup turns and your offense turns your opponent is just shoving their face into the meat grinder that is divine defense taking damage generating more resources for you letting you stack up those combat points in your coin purse so that you can pay for these incredibly expensive upgrades and powerful effects that the paladin has so if you really want to win games as Paladin, the thing you need to pay attention to most is when do you deploy which effect? And knowing when you need to tithe, when you need to use tithe to reroll, when you need to use tithe to draw a card, timing these things correctly. Paladin very much has the ability to make you feel like you have no idea what you're doing in this game. It can be so frustrating to play him. And that, that will even happen to some of the most experienced. Some of the best Paladin players are going to have those games when the dice just don't line up and it's whiff after whiff and there's no amount of combat points that can tithe you out of this. Your grip gets tiny, you can't draw cards, and he just falls apart. Paladin has this kind of like snowball effect where early in the game he's fairly vulnerable. But as he starts to generate more combat points, by generating more combat points, he's able to play 
more impactful and better cards, which in turn, if he's playing them on upgrading that defense or upgrading that, he's generating more combat points. So he generates combat points, plays something that lets him generate even more combat points. And once the engine gets rolling, this guy is going to draw through cards like a shadow thief. Uh, this is one of the heroes that realistically has the ability to get through his entire deck in a game, depending upon how he's piloted. If you're playing against a paladin and you want to stop this inevitability of the end game, be the beatdown. Uh, you really want to push damage as quickly as possible. I mentioned earlier that retribution can have a chilling effect on your opponent's desire to throw a big attack. Now, if you're the paladin player and you notice that your opponent opts for lower damage attacks when you have retribution never spend it just let it sit there just let it hang out and let your opponent beat themselves by not committing to the big damage attack now if you want to beat the paladin obviously do the exact opposite push that big damage dare the paladin to spend that retribution demand that they spend that retribution and the way you make that demand is by attacking with big numbers if you're attacking with small attacks the paladin has no incentive to spend that retribution as the antagonistic player you don't want to spend your status effect removal on retribution maybe it, there are situations where it's like well if he ret retributes here i lose the game okay and that one spend spend your removal but where you want to be spending your status effect removal is on those accuracies on those crits, on Paladin's ability to take his mediocre damage that's printed on his board and turn it into big damage. Further, the real way you beat Paladin is you mess with this guy's dice. Sometimes Paladin beats himself. Sometimes all you have to do is put your cards down. It's almost like somebody activated an ultimate on you. You know, you put your hand down, you pick up your health dial and say how much. Sometimes when you're playing Paladin, you put your cards down and you just watch him kill himself by whiffing after whiffing after whiffing because paladin's biggest weakness it really his kit doesn't have the weakness it's not like oh this guy's defense is bad so you can exploit that or oh his defense numbers or his attack numbers are low which his attack numbers are a little bit low but they're not like exploitably low his biggest weakness is in the awkwardness of his rolling kind of like huntress uh it can be so easy to push this guy into a whiff and if you force the opponent now don't get discouraged if you the paladin presents an ability and you helping hand and push him off his ability and he starts spending his uh combat points to tithe to re oh well let's re-roll this die but and oh now he got the ability back haha you did the right thing you still did the right thing because what you're doing is forcing combat points out of the paladin's coin purse and that's what you have to do because a paladin with a bankroll is really dangerous a paladin without a bankroll has a bunch of cards in hand he can't afford because all his stuff is so expensive. So if you want to take paladin down, mess with his dice. Apply his, don't spend your dice fix cards on yourself. Spend them to mess with him. Force whiffs, push damage. Don't be afraid of retribution. And if you want to win games with paladin, pay attention to what your opponent's doing. Be ready to settle in, play a longer game. If your opponent reacts negatively to retribution, keep it on there. Don't spend it. If your opponent knows how to deal with retribution, punish him for it. Oh, you wanted to attack me for 15? Cool. Feel good about giving them that damage back. Be very careful about getting into a shootout where you get ego tied up into making sure an ability activates. There's this thing that happens where I present an ability and my opponent helping hands or tips me off the ability. Well, then I tip myself back on the ability. Then he helping hands. Well, now I want to, now, now we're in, we're invested and we have kind of the sunk cost fallacy going on. There are times with Paladin where you have to just say, Hey, preserving my ability to take meaningful actions next turn is more important than dumping all my coins. I'm trying to reroll into something here. I just have to accept the whiff. Now, this is a thing as a player personally, I don't like having to do. And this is one of the issues I have with Paladin is sometimes the correct line of play with this guy is accepting a whiff. Uh, and that's just how he goes. Now, he doesn't get punished for whiffs as hard as some other heroes do. Again, because he has this bulwark of damage mitigation and healing that lets him last deeper and later into the game than a lot of other heroes were designed for. So if you like the kind of games where 
you want to go late, you want to grind your opponent out of gas, and then maybe have that one big flashy turn where you play every dice mod in the game all at the same time with your 300 combat points, and you just come at them with, with well, a righteous combat, then this guy is that power fantasy. He is great at taking the hits. Like, he doesn't dodge damage. Him, Paladin and Shadow Thief really share a lot of DNA in that Shadow Thief is dodging damage by staying in the shadows, and Paladin is just like, right here, I'm going to tank it all in the face, and I'm still going to beat you. So there are things I really like about this guy, but the awkwardness of his dice rolls for me as a player is a little higher than I like to deal with. So my biggest piece of advice, if you want to win games with Paladin, is play more games with Paladin. This is one of the trickiest characters. He has some of the most decision points, which is something that appeals to me. Uh, and when you don't get those decision right decisions right, he can really punish you and make you feel like you don't even know how to play this game. But if you push through that and you continue to work on those skills and you, you commit to sucking, which is if you want to get good at anything, you have to commit to sucking at it for a while. Paladin kind of exemplifies that in Dice Throne, maybe more than any other hero, where the, the gap between where you start and where you need to be in terms of familiarity with this hero is so large. And the way this hero can make you feel as you blindly fumble your way through that learning curve is so bad that I understand why people just go, oh, I don't want to play Paladin. But I promise you, if you push through that learning curve and you get to the far side, there is a rewarding hero experience on the other side. The thing you really need to ask yourself, though, is as a player, what appeals to me? And if having to make tons of high consequence decisions that can potentially lose the game for you, uh, if that's going to put you on tilt so hard that, that you wouldn't be able to play through the rest of your tournament day with a clear head, the Paladin might not be the hero for you because he definitely can put you in those positions. But if you're willing to navigate those treacherous waters and try to avoid these awkward roll attempts and, the, and figure out how you're going to pay for these expensive cards, there absolutely is a powerhouse of a dice thrown hero on the far side of that learning curve. So this has been a very challenging Dice Throne Hero uh, review and analysis for me. I uh, I hope I did the uh, darling of the competitive community justice in my breakdown of how I approach this hero. And uh, until next time, I hope you all win some games.